what we're going to do now is we're going to have a couple of talks, first mine and then one from Eric Martin about time resolve stacks. Uh, so this is kind of a, a specialty that we have here at BioCat. I want to start with kind of a, an overview of this. So there, there's a, a bunch of different methods you can use uh, to get different time resolutions. Uh, you can go all the way from, you know, like pump probe experiments with the XFL, where you get time scales less than 100 femtoseconds. Uh, synchrotron pump probe, which comes in around 100 picoseconds, kind of fast mixing, it's about 100 microseconds. And then, you know, other types of initiation where you have pressure jump, temperature jump, manual mixing, these kinds of things. Um, and so there's a, a wide range of time scales we can study, and there's a wide range of different kind of um, let's say reactions or, or changes that we can look at. And there's there's really two important considerations in my mind when thinking about time resolve stacks. The first is, you know, what's the time scale of the, the change that you're looking to see? And that determines kind of what method you want to do. And then also what's the initiation method, right? You know, if if you have something that it has to be initiated by changing the salt concentration, or changing the pH concentration, you're not really going to be able to do that with one of these laser excitation methods. Um, on the other hand, if you want to do a temperature jump, uh, these laser excitation methods are quite good, uh, things like that. So thinking about what the what the experiment you want to do depends on the system that you have in hand. You can't just set up a single system that will be good for every type of experiment. Um, so this is a, an overview of kind of different time scales. It's a little bit old now, so it doesn't include things like the XFL, but you know, accessible time scales. This is a log here, uh, and corresponding processes that might fit into those time scales. So I'm not going to go through in detail, but uh, what I want to highlight is kind of you know the the continuous flow mixing range, which is in stopped flow, which is what we do here at BioCat. And then corresponding kind of changes in um, macromolecules that you can see. So everything from kind of small uh, small structural changes, if you can resolve them, which you often can't, hydrophobic collapse, changes in conformation, tertiary contacts, things like that. So these are the kinds of changes that we're looking at. As you get faster, you get down into these kind of more fundamental uh, type changes where you have you know, individual side chains or things like that. Um, all the way into you know, protein quakes and stuff at the, at the XFL. So this is, I think, just here is a useful reference for you in thinking about kind of accessible time scales and, and accessible uh, processes. So when I talk about time resolve stacks, what we're doing is we're actually initiating a reaction and then we're measuring uh, changes in the sample at a number of different time points along that reaction trajectory. And so this turns out to be a really useful thing to do, in part because SACS is a global solution-based technique, right? There, you're never going to get atomic resolution on changes from SACS. But uh, so, you know, it's not going to replace, to some extent, like time resolve crystallography, where you can see individual side chains move. But on the other hand, you're not constrained by, say, a crystal lattice or uh, freezing the sample or things like that. And so you can see these kind of large global changes in a way that you can see with very few other techniques. You know, the closest comparison might be a time result in a Mars study, but then again, you're limited by kind of size of the macromolecule and that required concentrations. And so SACS, though it is relatively low resolution, but that's a term I don't often like to use, uh, is really useful because you get this, this kind of big picture without a lot of the constraints of a lot of the other techniques. Um, and really, in theory, any changes you can study with equilibrium stacks, anything you can see that we've been talking about previously or in the rest of the course, you can study with a time resolved experiment as well. Now, uh, one thing I do want to note is you'll often see time resolved stacks used in a, a very complementary way with uh, site specific probes, like, say, FRET. And this is because SACS gives you these kind of global constraints, and then getting the site specific constraints additionally gives you a lot of very good complementary information. So it's as we said on, on kind of day one, as Richard said on day one, I think, you don't often set out to do just SACS as your experiment, but you use SACS in conjunction with other biophysical or biochemical or biostructural techniques to add a lot of extra information. So, so what we specialize in at, at BioCat are these time resolved experiments. And so this is things, uh, there's two types of experiment that we do here. The first is stopped flow mixing. Uh, and the second is continuous flow mixing. And I'll go, go over what both of those are and why we prefer continuous flow in the next few slides. 
So I want to start with stop flow because I think conceptually it's kind of the most straightforward and it's also uh, been around the longest and the easiest to, to do in some ways. And so the idea here is a, it's, a, it's a mixing experiment. So you take two liquids, you mix them together. Usually it's a protein solution and then a solution that induces a reaction. So the classic example of this has always been looking at uh, refolding a protein. So you start out with your protein in a high guanidine solution. You mix it into a solution with no guanidine and you look at how the, the protein refolds in time. But you can also do things where you change the salt concentration, the pH, add in a ligand, add in a second protein. Uh, really anything that can be initiated by mixing two liquids together is something that we can study in theory. Uh, so in a stop flow experiment, immediately after mixing, the solution enters the sample cell, and then you close off the sample cell. And so you basically have this isolated volume. And what you do is you just sit there and you measure it repeatedly, and you watch this single volume evolve in time. Uh, and so stop flow is, is you know, very straightforward. You can buy the equipment commercially. Uh, typically with, with these experiments, the earliest time point you can reach is about a millisecond. And the latest is really however long you're willing to wait for that reaction to occur in the cell. Uh, but there are some downsides to stop flow. And there's reasons that, uh, at least the biocat, we don't prefer to do it. And the two main reasons are the first, you're sitting and you're measuring the same sample over and over as, as it evolves in time. And of course, uh, x-rays can induce radiation damage. And so <laughs> in practice, what this means is if you measure the sample for too long, you're not going to be sure if the changes are coming from uh, the time series itself, what the protein would naturally be doing, or uh, from x-ray induced changes because you're damaging the sample. Uh, and so what, to get around this, what you have to do is you have to limit your total exposure and then do multiple injections to measure the full time range. So you might say measure the first 50 milliseconds uh, of the exposure, um, one mixing event, then start the mixing again and measure from 50 to 100, and so on until you've built up the time series of interest. Um, you might also, uh, the other challenge is that, of course, because you're measuring the same volume as it evolves in time, your time resolution is only as good as the fastest exposure, right? So if you want to get a one millisecond time point, you have to take a one millisecond image. And these, that means you have very low signal to noise at these early time points. And again, you need multiple injections to build up signals. So you'll you know, do one injection and measure from one to 50 and one millisecond images, for example. You'll do that again and again, measuring that same time series and the same fast exposures. And so you built up a good signal to noise. It takes a lot of sample. Uh, is the answer. This is just a picture of what it might look like on the beam line in the interest of time. I'm going to move on quickly. Um, so here we have a, an example of a stop flow experiment. This was done at our beam line uh, 12 years ago now. So this was looking at uh, ribozyme uh, refolding. And so we measured the equilibrium endpoints, uh, this unfolded state and this folded state uh, starting to finish. And then using a stop flow mixer, we measured out uh, intermediate states, which you can see here and got a, a time series uh, watching the refolding go on. And so I'm not going to go into to the details, but this is the kind of thing that's possible, is you can watch these changes in time at, and see what they're doing with the Sachs curve and then interpret that in terms of what your sample is actually doing in solution with the methods we've talked about and we'll continue to talk about in this workshop. Because of the radiation damage concerns and because of the sample consumption, we don't typically recommend stop flow at our beamline, but I like to mention it because it's, it is pretty widely used. There's several beam lines that use it quite successfully. Uh, and there are certain types of experiments that may require this. But generally speaking, what we like to use is continuous flow mixing. So here you do the same basic principle. You mix together two liquids. But instead of doing this just in a static cell, we do this in a, a microfluidic mixer. And immediately after mixing, the solution enters a long observation region. Um, and so what you do is you you can keep your sample and your, your other liquid continuously flowing. Uh, and these flow through the mixing region out into the observation region. And you keep pumping sample through. And so you're basically continuously refreshing the mixed solution. Uh, and then in terms of observing a time point, you just move along this observation region to different distances from the mixing point. And it takes the sample some amount of time to travel there. And so that dictates what time point you're looking at in the reaction. So, you know, if your sample is moving at, say, a millimeter a second, just to pick a random number, and you move 
uh, 100 microns away from the mixing region, you'd be looking at um, uh, I guess millimeter a second. You'd be <laughs> I'll get my units wrong, but 10 milliseconds or something like that. I'd have to, to do a calculation more carefully, but I think I got the right exponential there. So as you move further down the channel, you get further time points, and that's how you get your time machine. Uh, there are downsides to this approach. The main one being the equipment's not commercially available. There's only one beam line, which is us, that routinely provides this approach. And there are several other groups that will bring their own equipment to the beam lines and, and do these experiments um, themselves. Uh, the time ranges depend on the mixers that you can achieve, uh, or on the mixers rather, as designed for our setup in SACS, and actually anybody's setup in SACS. The earliest time point is about 100 microseconds. The latest time point, it depends. At, at our beamline, it's, it's more like a second or two, but you can push this out further if you want. You may have to use multiple different types of mixers to kind of achieve the time ranges of interest. The advantages, though, are you minimize the radiation damage because you're continuously flowing a sample, and the measured time point doesn't really depend on the exposure time anymore. You can sit at a single point in the mixer, in theory, and measure as long as you want to build up good signal to noise. It's not actually how we do the experiments, but, but theoretically, you can do that. Uh, this is the, the setup. I'm not going to go through it in detail in the interest of time, but essentially, the main difference between a, a regular SACS experiment and a uh, continuous flow mixing experiment is we have a focusing optic in the beam, which focuses the beam to a very small size at the sample position. And this is because uh, we, to achieve really fast time points, you need a small observation channel. And this requires a very small beam so you can pass through that observation channel without hitting the edges. Um, we use a com what's called the compound refractive uh, lens which gives us a beam that's about 20 by 4 microns with a very high flux density, which is good for getting good signal to noise. There's some other considerations here as well that I mentioned simply because it, it's not trivial to simply show up at a beamline and, and ask for this experiment. Um, uh, even at our beamline, it's not quite so trivial. So this is a picture of what it might look like in practice. The mixer is, is sitting on this stage in here. At the end, um, the challenge is, as we measure different time points, we're moving along the mixer. And the, the mixing region is not completely, or the observation region is not uniform to the x-rays. And so different time points require scanning along the observation region. And so you get kind of point by point variation in the background scattering. And so you have to very carefully synchronize the, the exposure and the, the scanning to get really good buffer subtraction from these experiments. And this is something that we spent a lot of time and, and effort trying to get right. So I want to actually show you what one of these mixers looks like instead of just waving my hands in the air. Um, so this is our chaotic flow mixer. This is what we use for very fast measurements. It was designed and developed in collaboration with the Matthews Group at University of Massachusetts, in particular, Osman Bilsell. Um, and so this has been a, an ongoing project for about 10 years, maybe a little longer now at RBM1. Um, We've been iterating on the designs to kind of improve the low time points, reduce the amount of sample used. It's all guided by computational fluid dynamics. And so the idea here is you have the mixing buffer coming in. You have your protein. It goes through this kind of what we call an S-bend, which induces uh, mixing in the sample. And then it comes out into the observation region. And so the, the mixing time, the minimum time, is kind of set by a combination of how quickly you can mix it for this mixer is about 30 microseconds, and then how soon you can observe it. Uh, and so that's really our limitation here. We're at about 80 microseconds. And so you know we're continuously flowing. And then as the sample moves down the channel, it ages. So at this point, maybe it's at you know, 80 microseconds. At this point, it's at 120, and so on. And so we just move the x-ray beam down the channel, and we can look at different time points in the mixer. So these uh, have to be fabricated in quartz to withstand both the pressures for the mixing and the really intense microfocus X-ray beams. Um, we do that using a commercial company called Transloom. And these particular mixers, as I said, let us get from about 80 microseconds up to about 75 milliseconds. So this is our very fast mixer. This is what it looks like in practice. Um, not so impressive, I think, just this little piece of quartz. But, uh, you can get an idea of kind of the scale. You can see the inlets, the outlet. New mixers are actually a little bigger than this without a slightly longer outlet, but um, it's very similar. This is what it looks like in the x-ray beam. You can see those same kind of inlets and outlets. You can see the x-rays coming in here. 
and then scattering and going off down to the detector as we go to the left on this image. I think I'll skip this slide. This is just an example of kind of signal to noise. Uh, but I want to talk about one or two examples, and then we'll have uh, Eric hop on and talk about kind of in more depth an example of this. So uh, this is kind of the classic experiment in what these types of mixers were originally designed to do, which is a refolding experiment. So here we had cytochrome C and a denaturing buffer. We mixed it into a renaturing buffer. We watched the, the change um, as it uh, refolded. And so in this particular case, I wanted to ask whether the refolding collapse was continuous or barrier limited. Um, and so they used a combination of both SACS and FRET to study both the global and the local dynamics during the refolding. And so this is kind of the, the typical data that you might see from a time resolved experiment is this time series plot of the radius of gyration over, um, over time. And so you can see we start out large and then we collapse down to the smaller size. Um, you can also slide. You can also look at the individual scattering profiles as a function of time, and see how those are changing. So you can see we have these kind of uh, series of different states that they postulated existed, and then you know different time series points. So we go from kind of well folded, uh, or rather we go from unfolded initially into these eventually well folded native states. You can see these differences on the Kratky plot. And combining this information with the, the FRET, they're able to postulate these kind of existence of several different intermediate states in the refolding collapse uh, with these kind of distinct RGs that led down to this eventually this native state at long time. And so this is the, the kind of classic experiment that you'd be doing with these types of mixers. Um, but nowadays we can do, you know, not just refolding, but uh, ligand binding, looking at conformational changes, um, salt jumps where you look at uh, changes induced by that, which is, I think, what Eric will, will mention. Uh, and then we have uh, other types of things as well. So that's a, a very classic example. This is another example that really highlights the, the impact of, of having the complementary methods. Yeah, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip most of this one. Uh, where's the, ah, here, this is actually the slide I want. Sorry for jumping around. So here they initially did some time resolved FRET. And what they saw was that between different pairs in the, the FRET data, sometimes they saw a collapse, uh, an early collapse, and sometimes they didn't. And you can see that as the difference between the, the green and the, uh, the red curves. And some of them, they look very similar. So this is you know, uh, initially unfolded and then in a refolding buffer at early time. And in some cases, there's a, a significant difference. And so there seemed to be this kind of local collapse that wasn't reflected, reflected globally. When we looked at the SACS data, we saw that overall the global structure still looked uh, disordered completely. And so they were able to do some kind of uh, thinking about this and came up with an explanation that involved ensemble average conformational fluctuations between these different states that gave them both kind of a, a local ordering and a, a global disordering, which was a, an interesting result. And so it highlights the, the usefulness of having both site-specific and global uh, characteristics for your system. So that's uh, examples of this chaotic flow mixing, where we mix these together very quickly and then get these early time points. Um, the other type of mixing that we do here at BioCAD is what we call laminar flow mixing. So this is a, a similar idea. You flow in solution, you flow in a protein, but uh, the mixing itself occurs very differently. Rather than kind of tumbling it all together and then letting the fusion happen very quickly, uh, what you do is you focus the center stream, which is your protein, down to a very narrow uh, channel or very narrow sheath in the channel. And then that allows diffusion to occur very quickly across the, the sheath and cause rapid mixing. It's not as fast as what we can achieve with the other mixer. The minimum time point is about a millisecond, so a couple orders of magnitude up, or one and a half, really. Uh, but it's still pretty quick. And the advantage of this is it uses a lot less uh, sample. So this is a mixer we developed with the Arleth Group at uh, University of Copenhagen and based on a design from the Pollock Group at uh, Cornell. And so the example here is, is an example where we actually introduce a change by ligand binding. 
So this was a, a sample what we had from a, the Tang Group, uh, University of Chicago. And we were studying the insulin degrading enzyme and what actually the cycle looks like when you mix an insulin and how that goes through. And so they'd managed to get a combination of cryo-EM and, and extra crystallography uh, structures of a number of different high resolution, what they thought were intermediate states. Uh, but the time scale for changing in between those states was something that they didn't have. And so we were able to use uh, these laminar flow Sachs experiments to look at kind of the, the time scale of the change between um, insulin unbound and then insulin bound um, states. And so you can see this, uh, you can see it very clearly, the difference in the mid-Q region and in the RG. And uh, you can see that we go over, you know, through that transition on the scale of almost a, a second, but most of the action happens in the first kind of 500 milliseconds. And so using this set of experiments, they were actually able to, to kind of postulate along with the structures they had, this kinetic picture for the cycle, and also what the rate limiting steps were in this uh, process. And so this was a, a nice example of using this kind of longer time scale, still getting some very useful results out of it for this uh, com large conformational change that they were seeing. So just to kind of summarize them, and we'll have a, a more in-depth example in the next talk, so I don't want to, <laughs> to push that off too far. To summarize, we have uh, chaotic flow mixers. These give us the fastest time scales, uh, and they also require the largest sample consumption. This usually makes people kind of gasp, but typically at least 10 milligrams, uh, possibly more depending on the protein size. The laminar flow mixers give us longer time scales uh, and require less sample consumption, so there's trade-offs in either direction, and it really depends on the time scale that you want to reach. But uh, in theory, these, these are very powerful experiments, and if you have the right system, we're more than happy to, to carry these out with you. So if this is something you think, you think you might be interested in doing at BioCAD, first step is talk to the beamline scientists. The, these experiments require a lot of planning. You just can't show up with a sample and expect to run them. So we require every user who wants to do these to do equilibrium measurements at BioCAD first so we can check both the sample quality and determine the endpoints and make sure the change you want to see is something that's visible by SACS. Otherwise, Everybody will waste a lot of time and a lot of sample, and we won't get anything useful out of it. It's ideal if you've done other preliminary experiments that help you determine the relevant time scales, binding or off rates, fret, time resolve CD, things like this, and then plan on having a lot of sample, um, unfortunately. So just to kind of wrap up this, this introduction to time resolve stacks, then uh, we can do, this, do these experiments depending on where you go and what you want to look at from you know, 100 femtoseconds out to days if you're willing to wait a long time. But really, you want to pick the appropriate initiation method for the time scale of interest and the desired reaction. And that determines which of these experiments you want to do and where you want to go. Most commonly, at synchrotrons, we do stopped flow and continuous flow. And we can access kind of 80 microseconds to one and a half seconds using continuous flow mixing and, and longer time scales with stopped flow mixing. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to stop the talk, but I'm happy to take a question or two before we move on to, to Eric's talk.